Okay, let's start then. Welcome everyone. Uh, good uh, evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are. It's a, it's a pleasure for me to host uh, this first seminar of a, of a series of three webinars that we will dedicate to the links between climate change and inflation. So as, as you probably all know, in, uh, inflation is back or, uh, on the forefront of central bank concerns and also of monetary policy decision. Now, the current inflation uh, that we observe is obviously not directly linked to climate change, but uh, it concerns uh, raises in fossil fuel energy prices uh, as an underlying driver. And this is uh, closely related to climate change issue in the long term, especially about the evolution of the energy mix that the transition needs and then the evolution of, of its prices. Um, you might have seen that Isabel Schnabel uh, a few weeks ago now from Isabel Schnabel from the ECB executive board gave a, gave a speech in which she explained clearly uh, the drivers of inflation that are linked to climate issues and, and, I, and she distinguished between three types of inflation that I think is worth uh, reminding here to, to frame the, the, the three webinars that we will have in the, in the next uh, four weeks. So she distinguishes between fossil fuel inflation, which is the inflation resulting from higher prices for fossil fuel energy. Uh, it's, it's what is at the core of current uh, inflation spike, uh, but for, I would say, ge geopolitical reason. But uh, you know, it is also likely to influence, you know, fossil fuel inflation is also likely to influence inflation as we move uh, from a fossil fuel energy economy to renewable energy economy. So it also has long-term impact. The second inflation that she distinguishes is what she called transition inflation, which is the inflation resulting from the from policies and from transformations uh, that goes along with the transition to a renewable economy energy. And, and finally, she highlights uh, what she calls climate inflation, which is the impact of climate events like flow or flood, uh, their impact on, on prices. And today we will focus on the latest, or one example of the latest, who is a presentation from Miles Parker, a senior lead economist at the ECB, uh, which will tell us about the links between extreme heat uh, and consequences, extreme heat and uh, the, the consequences of, on, on inflation. So, the, this is the first webinar of, of our series on inflation and climate change. The series will continue on, on April 25 with a presentation by Richard Mussner from the EIS, who will present uh, empirical work on how carbon pricing, which is a policy necessary for the transition, can uh, or have shaped price levels in the last in the past 25 years. And, and we will conclude uh, this series on May 9th with a panel discussion where we will have the, the pleasure to have policymaker discuss uh, how theory about climate and inflation can inform policy. But uh, after this short introduction and, and without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today, uh, Miles Parker. Miles, thank you very much for, for presenting today. Uh, Miles is a senior lead economist in Directorate General Economics at the European Central Bank. And prior to joining the ECB, he was an advisor at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and a senior economist at the Bank of England. So Miles has a PhD in economics from Te Erenga Waka, I hope I pronounced it, it well, or Victoria University of, of Wellington. And his uh, research focuses on inflation and on the impact of climate. So today it's going to be both of that, <laughs> climate and inflation. And before giving you the floor, Miles, let me uh, start with a short poll uh, that we usually run. So you will have now uh, two questions uh, in front of you that I would ask you to, to answer. The first question here is, are disasters triggered by natural hazards, a supply shock or a dimension shock or both? And the second question, should central bank be interested in climate change for monetary policy reason? Uh, not at all, it's outside of their monetary policy remit. 
second option for secondary mandates uh, supporting general economic policies purpose or for primary mandate uh, purpose, i.e. for price stability. So if you could uh, quickly give your opinion on that, and that I guess the answer will kick, give a good uh, feeling to Miles about what the audience think about the, this topic. Uh, give you a, a few seconds more and whenever we have enough answers. You can see. So supply shock dimension shocks or both. Obvious, everybody, I mean, the majority is telling both. But uh, interestingly, there is a majority of supply shocks over demand shocks. So we'll be more concerned about supply shocks than demand shocks, of course. And then uh, should central bank be interested in climate change for monetary policy reason? Uh, almost nobody uh, thinks not at all, which is, uh, I guess, very different from what we used to think uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, for monetary mandate, for secondary mandate, 24%, but the large majority thinks uh, it is uh, interesting also for the primary mandate of uh, central banks, i.e. For, for price stability. So, um, Miles, about price stability, uh, we're looking uh, to, to hear what you have to say on, on physical shocks and, and, and inflation. And uh, I, will, I will collect, you can ask the question in the Q&A section, and I will collect the question and relay it to Miles after his presentation. Miles, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, let me find... Hopefully the right slides. If we're here on the slides, and you can, can you hear me fine. Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Your slides. Great. Good start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, EXE's forum as well for giving the opportunity to present this work. It's joint with two colleagues at the ECB, Donata Fatia and Livio Straka. Um, as per usual, the standard disclaimer for all, all work. It's it's my views, and not necessarily those of the the European Central Bank. Um, given time, let me let, let me just leap st straight in. Um, let me start with this slide as, as a motivation. You know, climate change is a fact. What, what do I mean by this? This chart shows temperature anomalies. So that's probably worth it's the, what we use in, in our papers, probably worth a bit of time going through. These represent the difference in temperature by country relative to the average of between 1951 to 1980, so the middle of the past century. Um, the solid line here shows the distribution across our, our sample of countries. Um, as you can see, it's centered pretty much around zero. So the, the mean in the 1980s was very similar to that mid-century average. Um, by comparison, the Distribution for the 2010s, that's a decade we've, we've just left, is noticeably different. The median, temp the median temperature has shifted up by a degree. Um, you see far more dispersion, and particularly far more dispersion on the, the right-hand side of the tail, which is to say that we see far more extreme heat episodes. Um, to put this in perspective, this is, this is the summer temperatures for our, for our our countries we look at. And the IPCC suggests for mid-latitudes, that is to say all of Europe, um, United States, that the summer temperatures sh should increase on average by roughly twice what the global average temperature increases. So when you hear about the Paris Agreement target of being 1.5 degrees, that implies summers in Europe on average three degrees warmer. So you've seen some of the difference already here in this chart. But even if we make that one and a half degrees Paris aim, then this distribution is still going to shift further rightward from where we, we see it now. If we hit two degrees, which is probably more likely in the best scenario, that distribution is going to shift to the right hand side of this chart. And if we 
do the current estimates of more than two degrees according to current policies, then actually the, the middle point of this distribution could be off this chart as shown. So we have already seen in the past three decades actually quite substantial warming over time, and that is likely to get worse. This is why I think extreme temperatures are something that's really important to think about in terms of understanding the economic impacts of, 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 of climate change. Now, what we talk about in this paper it's really to think about the impact on, on monetary policy through its effect on the, on the primary target of prices. Now, as I said, we're looking at extreme temperatures. We're not looking at transition effects on climate change. So for that, I'm afraid you're best to, to tune in in two weeks' time to listen to Eric Shield. Um, we're also not really considering other impacts of climate that might affect monetary policy, and in particular, the impacts on the transmission mechanism. So that's not just the impact of transition policies on prices, but the transition itself with economic dislocation and um, industrial change and sectoral upheaval can influence how much a policy um, affects prices overall. So those things are important things to consider about climate change, but I'm not gonna talk about them today. I'm gonna focus really on, on natural hazards. Now, if you look at the literature that exists to date, which is small, but at least growing, um, for the most part, it, it, it focuses on the big four. So that's earthquakes, which aren't really climate related, um, windstorms, floods, and droughts. Um, so short term, in the short term, these events typically have negative impact on GDP. It's certainly more pronounced in emerging markets. Um, and that's found by a whole range of, of papers. The long term impact on GDP is somewhat less certain. Um, there is some papers find evidence for creative destruction. So you have a disaster that destroys capital and use the opportunity to repair your capital, invest in, in higher technology capital. Um, that certainly seems to be true for kind of middle income countries, which are very connected to the world trade. Um, less so for least developed economies. Um, uh, my personal read of the balance of literature is probably there's a probably slightly negative long term impact. That's more certain. Um, how will the impact in the short term? And this gets to this question about is it supply shock or is it demand shock? Now, I can tell you, having talked about this stuff for more than a decade, the, the general answer to that all the way through has been their supply shocks. They destroy capital, they push prices up, they reduce demand, they reduce activity. Um, and the literature for that disasters has for a while pointed to actually demand effects too. Um, particularly poverty traps. This is where a disaster happens. It destroys the capital of particularly poor people and they are unable to then use that capital um, to produce in later years. And because they lose their income, they're, they're forced to make fire sales. And, and as a result, you actually see negative demand effects coming through too. Um, now, since COVID's come along, people have a, a much more bright, broader and more wide understanding that actually supply shocks and demand shocks can go hand in hand. Um, the paper on Keynesian supply shocks by Gary et al is a, is a really great way of modeling this, this, this um, idea that's been already in the disaster literature for a long while. So yes, you have a supply shock, but you also have some concomitant demand shock. So the overall impact is somewhat ambiguous in terms of the source. Um, now, evidence on inflation for these, uh, these particularly these big four, tends to roughly agree with that, 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 that conclusion. So the overall impact on inflation is ambiguous. Um, and I think I'm just gonna unpack that slightly to, to give you an idea of time scales. I think there's three stages that's really important here. The, the first stage in terms of impact on prices is the really immediate aftermath in the, in the first couple of days or weeks. And their evidence from supermarket pricing, for example, suggests very little movement at all on prices. Um, you, you can think of the, the impact of COVID when it started. Did supermarkets hike up the price of toilet paper until they balance supply and demand? No, they choose to have shortages rather than put prices up. So price gouging immediately after disaster is generally viewed quite badly. Um, in the, the shorter term, now going to, to two or three quarters, you see short-term impact 
very much positive on prices and particularly on food prices, particularly from things like floods, droughts, you see this, this, this bigger impact. What you see later on, so after a year, 18 months, particularly in the non-food areas, so the, 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 the core, core inflation, if you will, is you tend to see often negative inflation dynamics. That's particularly pronounced um, actually in, in advanced economies where, if anything, the net impact is probably slightly negative. Um, so bearing in mind, going through this, this presentation, you generally have this balance between the, the two shocks, um, with the supply shock being very much more prominent, prominent in the near term, slightly less prominent in, in, the, in the least term. But that's the big four. What about um, what about the impact of, of extreme temperatures? Well, I'm afraid to say extreme temperatures are very much the ugly duckling of natural hazard research. Um, there's very little research overall on, on how extreme temperatures have economic impacts. Um, there's some on GDP data, on, on output activity. So if you look at Dayatal and Acevedo, um, they look at annual data of extreme temperatures. Um, they find in general a negative impact on developing economies. Um, a bit harder to find on advanced economies, um, not really conclusive. They do find, however, that the impact seems to be higher for the, the higher your average temperature it is, and you, then the impact is greater. So if you're a relatively cold country, a slight increase in temperatures is possibly slightly positive for you, but the hotter you are, the more likely the impact is to be negative. Now, Colosito et al. looked at um, input impact of US states using quarterly data, and they find that actually the quarter matters. So um, hot summers, so summer heat waves, tend to have a quite marked negative impact, even, even in the United States. But warmer temperatures elsewhere in the year are in, insignificant or actually in autumn slightly positive. Um, so there is certainly things to think about in terms of extreme temperatures. It clearly matters when in the year they happen um, and the type of economy they affect. But for prices, really, there hasn't been anything in the literature that really looks at this. Um, and the, the point of this paper I'm presenting here is ready for this ugly duckling to become a swan. Um, now, that's not always great news for everyone. Uh, I should say in New Zealand, swans are black. So let me, let me go through from here our paper. Um, we have two parts to the paper which I'm going to take you through today, if I get through enough time. Um, the first one, we have a theoretical framework, a, a small conceptual model just to dig down to think about some of the impacts in terms of sectors in the theoretical framework. And then have an empirical section that looks at the impact on prices for 48 emerging and advanced economies. The model I'm going to skip through is quite fast because lots of it is fairly fairly standard vanilla. We have a two country model, one advanced, one developing, and two goods, food and non-food, both of which are tradable. Um, the developing emerging economies have a higher share of food in their consumption. Um, temperate shelf is subject to both common, so that's worldwide shock and the country specific shock. And we assume that that hotter temperature affects food prices, negatively affects food production. Um, now food here is a shortcut for basically all climate sensitive sectors. Um, we have a pretty standard New Keynesian non-rigidities model and hence monetary policy follows a standard Taylor rule targeting the sticky price center. So we assume that food prices are flexible and that non-food is, is sticky. Um, and finally, non, we have imperfect risk sharing. So you can only have a one period bond to be traded. So here's our sample of goods in the model. We basically have food and non-foods, and they're split between both foreign and, and, and home production. The utility is positive consumption, negative in, in, in labor supplies. We have a pretty standard CS aggregator for consumption goods, which aggregates both home and foreign production with Gamma here, it's a home bias. There's some home bias in, in, in production. In terms of goods themselves, again, pretty standard CES production. So we have food and 
non-food aggregated to the consumption bundle. Um, alpha here, its main thing is the share of food. So we calibrate it such that the share of food in um, advanced economies is lower than it is for developing economies. Um, budget constraint, again, that's a pretty standard normal budget constraint. We assume bond position domestic currency will reduce the price of currency, um, currency pricing. Production sides, this is where it just differs slightly. So we have a standard um, productivity shop for non-food. And for food, we have this, this, this uh, climate shock. So we assume that higher temperature reduces productivity uh, in the food sector. Again, price of sticky alcohol for non-foods and flexible for food. So let me talk a bit about that climate shock. It's it simply, it can either be basically a, a global shock. So you see both the home and the foreign economies have an increase in, in temperatures or you have an idiosyncratic. So basically the, the home country has a heat wave and the foreign country does not. In both cases, we assume a fairly persistent shock. Monetary policy, again, a fairly standard Taylor rule. So the, the, the monetary policy authority um, targets the sticky price sector, that's the non-food non sector. Um, and there's also a map of inertia. So, so the row is the basically the, the amount of inertia in the in the um, in the March policy rule. We assume that the emerging economy central bank is a bit less committed to the central inflation target. So its in, interest rate overall is is slightly more inertial. In other words, the row is a bit higher. Um, we have UIP for exchange rates and PPP holds for food. So this is this is the the model. Um, I think it's possibly easy to start thinking about the the blue dotted line first. So that's an idiosyncratic shock for the home economy. Um, so temperature you see goes up initially. You have a sharp increase in food price inflation. That's this chart here. here. Um, that results in a a worsening exchange, a essential depreciation and a reduction in the terms of trade. But the interesting thing here is you see a reduction in non-food non for home. And that's because you actually have an income effect where the reduction in terms of trade and the higher price of food re reduces income. Um, it actually affects both economies somewhat similarly in that sense um, through the exchange rate. The red line is a common shock, so both economies get, get affected. And the result of this is a, pretty much a reduction in income and, and inflation. There's little impact on the exchange rate in the end in terms of trade because both economies are affected. And that difference is mostly due to the different weight of food in, in the consumption bundle. So just to summarize, and I appreciate that's a, a lightning fast presentation of the model. What does our model predict using those reasonably, mostly standard uh, um, assumptions? Firstly, both a common or a local temperature shock leads to sharp increase in food prices. That's not really a surprise. That's where we model the, the impact to happen. But it's also important to note that there's very strong international spillovers. So even if only one economy gets hit by the food price shock, you see that food price via the flexible foods, via the international trading of, of food, affecting both economies. Um, now, that's very much in keeping with the research of Pearsman and Wynne that um, find that actually food price shocks from climate actually have a big driver of volatility in euro area inflation. So euro area inflation is affected not just by domestic climate shocks, but actually climate shocks around the world. Um, we find a small decrease in inflation in our sticky prices. So again, this is somewhat a negative demand shock from lower income. Um, in our model, the way it works out 
is that still dominated effectively by the food price inflation. So to get the full negative inflation that you'd have from a Keynesian supply shock, we can't really show in the structure of our model, but it certainly shows that there's opportunities for that. Um, and again, you get the exchange rate depreciation. So these are things to, to think about going through looking at our, our empirical results, which I shall move to now. So you have a sample of 48 economies, both advanced and emerging. Um, advanced is most advanced economies in, in the world. Emerging, we have uh, a number of important ones, South Africa, Brazil, China, Chile, Philippines. Um, the main sticking point here is actually um, finding quarterly GDP deflator data, for which is a lot more difficult for, for those emerging economies. Um, we have quarterly frequency from 1990 through 2018. It's not quite balanced. We haven't quite got everything we need back to 1990, but from 2000, at least we have basically all the economies in every quarter. Um, then source the temperature anomalies, that's the, the anomalies I showed you from the very first, very first slide, they're from FAO stats. Um, they're based ultimately on, on NASA data. So again, they are an anomaly relative to the 51 to 1980 average by country, by season. Um, these are the highest quality anomaly data we can get because the these are, are matched on a quarterly frequency station to station. So the issue is simply taking means um, or anomalies from, from reports as you may have a, a change in, in station representation, or even you might have a change in station itself. You could, for example, in Frankfurt have had a, a monitor that moves from Frankfurt city center to the airport, or you might also find that some stations may have been at the base of a mountain and then a couple of years later it gets put to an automatic station at the top of a mountain. So this data um, really matches to make sure that the anomalies are based at a station level. Um, the disadvantages we have only that therefore at quarterly data. Um, other prices, we take CPI headline food and non-foods. Um, we take um, the food data and non-food from, from my earlier paper. The reason for doing this is that that very carefully matches what food means. So it is Koi Cop 1.1 foods. Um, and, you, and make sure we don't, for example, include things like restaurants and catering that otherwise can be included in food or alcohol and tobacco. So it's very much making sure we have food proper. Um, we have PPI data from the IFS, supplemented in a couple of places by national sources. Um, GDP data also from the IFS. Um, as some of our variables, GDP from the, mostly from the OECD. We have some stuff from World Bank, such as land, air, and share of agriculture. Um, and we use the IMF's classification here for advanced versus, versus emerging. Um, the main empirical way of doing it is, is the panel local projections following from Jordan. So that takes for each quarter, the difference in price relative to H lags. Sorry, it's move forward, it's, it's the H lags. Um, the, the variable interest, the impact of, of temperature on these price, the change of price level. We have lagged inflation, we have country and time fixed effects to, to, to pick up other, other areas. Um, the main anomaly we take, it's a, it's a dummy. So the dummy is one when the temperature exceeds by one and a half degrees from the anomaly of one and a half degrees, which it means to say we're looking at best heat and extreme heat events. So it's a, so rather than a, a fully linear or thing, we're only looking basically at a heat wave or in fact a cold wave. Um, and that's to say that most of, most of disaster literature finds that small, small perturbations really do not have much impact on the economy or even on prices. Um, there, is a, there is usually for most economies a threshold of resilience, at which point when you, when you cross that threshold, that's when you really start to see um, economic impact. So we're saying basically 
you know, there is very, very little impact from very small changes in temperature. It's only when you have them sufficiently large enough. Um, to give you an idea of roughly where one and a half degrees C, C means, if you look back to the 1980s, then that anomaly itself was in the 95th percentile. So for most economies would have this kind of summer heat wave only about once every 20 years. Um, it has become clearly with the shift in temperatures far more common in the recent decades. That's why as we go later, we'll also look at adaptation. So rather than looking relative to that mid-century mean, we can look relative to the previous decade. Um, so let me start with the short-term impact. So this looks simply at CPI food and non-food. We find that cold winters have no impact on any price measure. Um, hot winters do have, in fact, a positive impact on food in the, in the, in the winter itself. Um, hot springs, again, slightly positive, sorry, slightly negative, so uh, reduced by a small amount um, CPI inflation. Hot awesomes have no impact. Um, if you, in case you're wondering why we have no cold springs, summers or autumns, and that's simply because as the distribution shifted, we simply do not have enough observations anymore of these cold spring, summers or autumns. What it is very noticeable on the other hand is hot summers. So hot summers not only have a significant impact in both in the, the quarter itself and the following quarter, but it's far more sizable impact than the other quarters. And, and more to the point, what I'm not showing here in this table is to actually have impact much further out in, into, into the future. Whereas these other seasons really have one at, at most two impacts, two quarters of impact. Now we do a, a bunch of robustness on this, the, these findings. Um, we try a, a range of different local projections. We use mean group estimation. We control for droughts. We use the World Bank uh, temperature data as source, of, as source information. Um, all, all these different robustness checks come basically to the same conclusion. Um, they're all in the paper. Um, well, using some covariates, we do have some interest in terms of channels of impact. The impact on food prices is greater in countries of higher share of agriculture GDP. So that goes back to our model that we showed earlier. So it, it is reasonable to assume that it's one important um, channel of impact. Secondly, the, the impact is larger where absolute temperatures are higher. Um, so that's using World Bank data. For countries, for a, a given size of anomaly, that impact is higher when the base level of temperature is, high, is itself higher. So cooler countries, again, a slight summer heat wave isn't as, isn't as bad and maybe even slightly positive in terms of impact, whereas it becomes larger the hotter the countries are on average. Let me move on to the medium term impact. So this now looks at course of eight quarters. Um, the impact on food, again, is very clearly positive in the near term lasting for a couple of quarters, um, that impact turns negative but insignificant um, thereafter. On non-food, there isn't a great deal of significant impact. Um, for PPI and also a bit for GDP deflator, which don't show here, you actually see a negative impact, um, but itself not particularly significant. What is worth doing though is splitting up between our types of economies because the impact is distinctly more marked for the red that's here, that's emerging economies, where the impact on food is much greater. That also, because of the larger share of weight, has a much greater impact on, on CPI, um, headline CPI. We do find a positive impact in the near term for advanced economies. Um, I promise you it's positive. I also, as you can see, it's also not very big. Um, and here for, again, for, a, Developing economies, it's the PPI. So the, you do see some of these additional effects coming through other industries that don't show up so well in CPI. Um, next, look at adaptation. So, as I said, the, the issue is we have had this the shift in over, over decades and increased high temperature. 
is there potential for adaptation? Can you change the crops you normally plant? Can you, can you, I don't know, increase air conditioning if that becomes an issue? Um, so this adaptation here is the like same method, but rather than looking at compared to the mid-century average, it simply looks at if you have a big anomaly relative to the previous decade. So that enables some adaptation over time. The results are broadly similar between the, 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 two, the two measures. Um, so that's just that there isn't a great deal of scope for adaptation, um, at least in the time scales we're, we're, we're looking at here. Um, what I think is interesting, though, is looking at nonlinearity of info impact. So, so here we can here we split between hot summers and very hot summers. So this is just for advanced economies. Hot summers, is, we define as those between one and a half and two degrees. And the very hot summers are uh, where the, um, the anomaly is greater than two degrees. Um, now, these very hot events have become more frequent. They were basically unheard of in the 80s um, and have become far more frequent in, in recent decades. Um, and here, I think, is, is quite interesting. So this again, I talked about threshold of resilience. It does appear that these slightly mild impacts, it's like, I say mild, the hot summers do in general have um, a positive increase, uh, increase in food. So here you see a supply shock coming through. But what you see instead for these very hot is actually far more marked impact and actually uh, a far more negative impact. So such that overall CPI falls significantly by about 0.6 after two years. Now, that, for an advanced economy, a 0.6 change in the level of CPI after two years is pretty large. Um, so, I, let me let me wrap this up so we have time for some questions. Um, the, the our model, but certainly our empirical results, suggest that extreme temperatures are something that's certainly worth thinking about in terms of the economic impact of climate change. Um, the, mat the season matters most. It's hot summers that are most meaningful, have the most durable impact. And again, remember what I said, going back to start, for mid-latitudes, Europe, United States, um, it's the summers that are going to increase the most, right, given the average increase. So hot summers having impact matters a lot because these are things that like to be most affected by climate change. There is a twin shock. Um, it, in the short term, in this course, it, it's definitely a, a, you can think of as a, a negative supply shock through agriculture. But we do see that unwinding and some negative impacts on inflation dynamics in the medium term. So there is still this demand shock element, negative demand shock element coming through. Um, and again, we, we show impact on GDP is negative, so that, that's that's a reasonable interpretation. Um, but it's the nonlinear and things that I think are worth really considering here. The impact is greater the higher the absolute temperature. The impact is larger the greater that anomaly divergence. What that means is, as average temperatures rise, and the tail of that distribution for the, the greater number of hot events happen, it means that countries that today have been roughly spared in the past impacts from these, these uh, extreme temperatures may not be quite so lucky in the future. Um, moreover, we show that is that significant impact on inflation in advanced economies um, from these events, which are already becoming far more common relative to were a couple of decades ago. As a result, um, we conclude that climate changes are already, in fact, beginning to bear on inflation and hence in the primary mandate of, of monetary policy. Um, so in terms of climate inflation, I think we're already starting to see signs it's here and evidence, I believe, from, from, our, from our research suggests that um, it's become more prominent as we move later decades in this, in this century. So that's... That's, I admit, a pretty fast run through of the paper. Um, I, I should say that the paper itself is published uh, as a working paper on the ECB um, website. Um, and always happy to have feedback. Anyway, 
Thank you very, very much, Miles. Um, I just uh, remind uh, the participant that you can ask the question in the Q&A session and I will relay them. Uh, but in the meantime, <clears throat> maybe a, a few starting questions on my side. What, what struck me is, um, you know, you, you have a nice uh, way of assessing what's the impact of a shock on inflation or uh, like the shock from a heat wave. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> as you pointed out, this, these shocks might not be like temporary shock, might not, not be shocks anymore in the future, in the sense if you have like a, a, you know, a higher temperature, you know, year long or every year, that's not shock. I don't think you can call shock that shocks anymore. It's, it's a permanent feature. So do you have a sense of, on how this will impact inflation uh, if if these shocks are permanent or continuous or repeat, repeated every year? So I think there's there's two parts to this. One is the average temperature increase. That's, you know, people talk about the, the Paris cycle, one and a half degrees, two degrees. That is a permanent mean increase, right? And then for summer, particularly for Europe, you're gonna see actually that mean increase will be much larger, but that's still a mean increase. But what also matters is not just that mean, but also the variance around that mean. So if you start adding up both the mean increase, but also that you're likely much higher than the mean because those tails are much fatter, the overall increase you're going to see in some summer temperatures is going to be quite dramatic relative to where we are today in terms of the average. So I think both these, these things are important. Um, a big question comes in terms of adaptation. No, can, can we, as average temperatures increase, be able to, for example, change our crops? Can we change the variants we use or, or move, do we move from wheat to maize to millet? Um, now, I mean, Nordhaus looking at this in his, his EJ paper, it's in 1980, I think it was, says, oh, it's fine, you just adapt by crops, right? You stop, you stop using wheat, you move to, um, citrus and then you move to wine and um, hell actually so fine because you know wines wines are higher higher return per acreage from, from wheat but that means if that's true then we're not have wheat anymore we just have wine so we can enjoy several glasses of good wine and not worry about eating um it's not it's not let me cake it's let them let them drink wine um i i, I have some caution about that which is um, that stuff takes a real a lot of time to change, and our results, at least, just at least in the decade scale, that's quite difficult. Um, and I'm and I'm not sure we'll be able to do it entirely. I mean, science should help um, in terms of economic activity. It is thinking about how we do we have enough air conditioning, and there's also we just reach those limits of of what of what countries can and actually human can cope with. Um, I remember living in New Zealand, my wife and I agreed we'd never move to Australia because it's already just too hot. Um, and we thought Frankfurt was a, was a great place in that sense, but we've had a couple of 38 degree summers here in, in, in Frankfurt. And I can tell you that's a real struggle to deal with. Um, as temperatures hit certain limits, it's human ability to operate deteriorates quite rapidly. So yeah, we have to think about how much can we adapt and, and how much can we not. And some we can. Uh, I am a bit somewhat skeptical about ability to adapt to the rest of it. And know others are far more sanguine. I mean, from, from your answer, what, the, what I, I get more than, than my question is basically that, you know, even if we see uh, like this shock being repeated and the mean, the mean uh, temperature increasing, you, we will still see a, a larger dispersion of the shocks around this meat. So we might have like, not only more frequent, frequent uh, heat waves, but also like a stronger heat wave, a larger heat wave. So it will still remain a shock in a sense uh, around, the, around the, the mean, even if exactly. we adapt. And I, and I guess adapting is uh, to this kind of viability and shocks is much more different than adapting to a higher mean temperature by, by switching to wine. 
Um, I mean, when when you when when you see these shocks, uh, I mean, so so we have shocks from heat wave, but we have we have we have also um, other um, climate events that will increase in frequency and and. Do they all go in the same direction as what you found? So we will like kind of have a combination of of the of more frequent, uh, you know, uh, climate hazards that we that will uh, have the same impact, or is it, or do you, from your experience, is that only limited to heat wave and food, or what I mean? So the impact here of heat waves, I would say, is roughly similar to that of droughts. Um, in terms of my previous work looking at the, the big four, um, droughts are somewhat similar. You see this, 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 this quite significant impact that seems to be quite durable. Um, storms and floods have a short term impact on food, but that tends to disappear, to be honest, after, after one or two quarters. And you don't really see as much a long term impact from, from those kind of um, acute climatic fiscal risk rather than the hazards, the heat waves and droughts tend to be tend to be longer running. Um, so the same these results are in keeping with those, those, those previous ones. You, you're right, we do have to deal with great instance of, of these events. Um, now we did check by the way for droughts and it's true that hot summers have slightly less rain, but actually um, there's not a great map, particular correlation between that, all right? Many of our hot summers here still have fairly average rainfall. You know, there's, you know, there's not a great combination of, of, of that. So you have higher droughts and high extreme temperatures. The two don't necessarily go together, but both are, are increasing risk as, as we progress through this, this century. Now, if we, if we are facing, I mean, at least in the, in the short to midterm, let's say supply shocks, uh, what what can can be the, the reaction of the central bank to to these shocks? Because uh, just from 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 your findings here, uh, it's mainly through uh, a shock on food prices that things materialize, and uh, you know in emerging market it translates into CPI because uh, food has a has a higher share there. But at the same times, uh, food is a essential good, and you cannot really decrease, uh, you know, re reduce uh, your, your consumption of food. Uh, and then, for example, if you, if you, um, if you have a, a wealth shock, in a sense, central banks um, cope with, with shocks by kind of managing uh, demand with, with, a, with a health and, and income shock. And if food is not really reacting to that, um, do you see, is that a concern that you share or you... I mean, uh, I have a I have a real concern here, which is actually just this this these need these wealth and negative impact, negative shocks in the, in, in the future. A central bank that that reacts to increasing food prices by jacking up interest rates risks exacerbating the the downturn further along the line, um, even even as the initial supply shock eases. Um, at the same time, of course. When you have far more volatility, you do have that horrible problem with um, expansion expectations and how languid you are and how effective your policy will be in the future to other shocks. Um, one of the things that really important to remember when it comes to climate change is we're going to have far more shocks affecting the economy from climate, but the rest of the business cycle is not going to disappear. We're still going to have everything else that drives change in inflation and, and the business cycle you know non-climate recessions are still going to happen i'm pretty i'm pretty certain of that um and sometimes the interaction between those two can matter too so um the work and the strategy view at the european central bank looked a combination of um climate shocks with the business cycle and pointed out that actually this these things can actually risk you hitting that lower bound on on real rates on long rates far 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 more frequently and end up far more prolonging the session because you can't guarantee that these negative climate shocks can occur when you're at neutral when you know the economy is growing when 
when interest rates got plenty of room. You can't guarantee they're going to happen at the right time. Um, the, the Murphy's Law says they were happened at exactly the wrong time. It's a bit like having COVID and then having a war in Europe. I mean, these things happen exactly the wrong, wrong time and climate will happen at the wrong time in the future. Now, I would like to make a comparison with uh, financial stability when it comes to price stability. Yeah. In financial stability, now there is kind of a consensus uh, forming among central banks that basically a world that has transition is, uh, is safer in terms of financial stability than, than a world a uh, hothouse world, as the ECB is saying. So basically, if we have a transition uh, in the midterm, you will have less uh, shock to financial stability. And therefore, a transition is basically the, the way to, to decrease the uncertainty about financial stability. Whereas if you, if, if we do, we, you don't uh, transition, you end up in a hothouse world where you have more threats for financial stability. So in a sense, Central Bank have an interest to, to see the transition happening for financial stability reason. Do you think it's, we can make the parallel with price stability? I mean, is, is a world that has transitioned a better world for a central bank in terms of price stability than letting no transition at all and ending up in a hot house world? Do you have some findings on that already? Or? I, mean, I, I, I think personally, a hot house world is not a pleasant one for market policy. Um, Increased rates of shocks, this variability in inflation, even if it's just near term, the variability is a pain for, 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 for monetary policy to deal with. Um, and the two interlinked of flexibility too, right? We know from the euro area crisis um, just a decade ago that financial instability is itself a problem for monetary policy. When the transmission mechanism breaks down through financial stability, monetary policy can't do its job to stabilize the economy. So, this hot house world affecting flexibility is of itself already an issue for monetary policy and meeting our mandate of price stability. Um, and this mix, uh, as I characterize it, of, of supply shocks and demand shocks, not really knowing which is where the balance lies, it, it, it's very difficult for a policymaker faced with extra volatility to really know, you know, what, what to do with policy. And, and as we know, what, what's the best ex ante policy doesn't always look the best ex post policy once you've had um, large changes in the world because of shocks that were unforeseen, maybe even unforeseeable, but let's leave unforeseen. Um, so yeah, this, this, is, this is a real challenge, um, I think, for, for monetary policy. And, that, and that's why um, as difficult as the transition will be, particularly if it's disorderly, the, the end result for monetary policy of a hothouse world, I think is particularly unpleasant. So in a sense, we have now like two big reasons for central bank to, to have an interest in seeing the transition happening in a smooth and early transition happening at least. It's, it's, it's a better world for financial stability. It's a better world for them to manage also inflation. Um, so we, 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 do, we do say that in that sense, um, central banks, if they can do something uh, to foster the transition, that would be in, in their interest uh, of, or in the interest of this objective to, to try to make this uh, transition happening. And I'm not talking about how they can do that. There are many ways and we can talk about it, but in, in a sense, supporting initiative for the transition is, is something in the, that they should see favorably, basically. I mean, I, I think for me, the evidence here is that we should consider climate change as a primary mandate issue and from that we should depending on the mandate it differs between central banks i think we should think very carefully about how we can contribute um, there are long debates which we can spend for the next three hours debating about proportionality about effectiveness about while well, making sure that we don't overly deteriorates the, you know, we're detrimental to our price stability mandate in the near term by, by trying to do stuff that's, that may help the long term. Um, it depends a lot as well on what your, your public mandate is. I mean, the Bank of England has a very clear mandate here. The, the ECB through the treaty provisions 
also has a reasonably clear mandate within set limits. Um, for other central banks, their mandate may not be so clear. I mean, if your mandate says price stability of an inflation target in a year's time, then you don't have necessarily maybe much latitude to to make any difference in that if it's gonna if it's gonna affect in the future. Uh, you know, for your legal mandate does matter. Um, and and thinking very carefully about what that means and what your 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 ability to to influence um, that policy. Uh, one of the best things we can do as central banks, I I believe, again, this is me talking, is to talk about this. One of the things we've really done as a central banks is to really drive the the discussion about climate change and economics. I think it's been given far more prominence. Um, it's, it's nice having people come in this, this, this seminar today. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my previous work looking at natural disasters and inflation, um, I can tell you five years ago, I sent to a journal and the referee said they couldn't see the relevance of the topic. So I'm pleased to see um, people here today at least think that that has changed. Um, and it's good, uh, I'm really happy to see it. Um, Maybe more useful for me five years ago, but, but better late than never. I mean, we, we, we definitely have we definitely have seen a change, uh, uh, you know, on the in the interest of um, linking central bank to to uh, climate change, and not only from academics reviewers, but uh, from central central bank in general. And I think uh, that, that uh, exactly this the, the, your kind of study linking it to uh, to the primary mandate make make just it you know relevant from an agnostic point of view. If they are just Phenomenon that link inflation to climate that uh, that must be thought through and, and maybe addressed uh, without really, you know, with, without uh, having the feeling to be out of the money at all. Uh, so that's, uh, we we are slowly coming to an end. Uh, there is one question about um, you know, I think it's from from Caracas and Tisani. I think asking if you see a parallel between you know. Having a kind of a proactive precautionary approach from central bank in in reducing uh, in, in going in a transition and kind of the the, the precautionary saving that what could that what could have in in facing uh, uncertainty. So in a sense, you know, um, climate change is going to bring a, a lot of uncertainty for uncertainty for central bank. Uh, do they need kind of a proactive precautionary approach to try to 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 decrease this uncertainty in a sense or to 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 have enough uh, policy space to to address this uh, higher uncertainty well part we discussed that already it, it, it depends yeah. actually whether you have space in your mandate to do that not everyone does but it, Actually, it's, it's another great point, in fact. Um, you're right, there's this risk of precautionary savings from this greater uncertainty. What does that do? Well, it, it lowers the equilibrium interest rate. And we've already spent a decade where we've struggled with the effect of lower bound on interest rates. And if those equilibrium rates fall further because of climate, that's even less space for, for um, much policy to act. Um, yeah, the, the, the strategy of you, the simulations we carried out, we looked indeed at, at what happened if you had this lower rate with the extra shocks. And it, it really was um, a real strain for much of policy, again, because you had this normal business cycle shocks, but then the already the lower um, equilibrium rate already meant you had more time at lower bound. You had this more kind of slower recoveries. And if you add further shocks on top of that, you know, it, the, these things combined make it very uncomfortable um, for, for monetary policy in this hothouse world. Um. So we're reaching the end of the of the hour. Thank you very much, Miles, for for this uh, this presentation and, and talking about the physical uh, aspect of of climate change and its uh, impact on inflation. Uh, as I I told you in the beginning, in the next uh, seminar, which will take place on uh, April twenty five, we will look at more at. Uh, transition impact on inflation, and especially uh, carbon pricing policy, what is the impact on inflation. And we will have uh, a presentation 
uh, by Richard Muster, uh, who will present her, her paper on the effects of carbon pricing on inflation. Um, as I told you, after this, the, this uh, presentation, we will finally have a, a, a policy panel uh, on the same topic to see what uh, policy conclusion we can dry, uh, the, drive from this, uh, from, from the finding by academics on transition and inflation and on, on uh, physical uh, risk and inflation, as you presented it today, uh, Miles. Thank you very much, all. Uh, thank you very much, Miles, and uh, see you in two weeks. Thank you all.